If you'll turn to the book of 1 Peter, we are currently studying through that right now as a church. Um, We are looking at chapter 1, and this morning we'll give our attention to verses 10 through 12, really just verse 10. Uh, This could be my favorite verses now in this whole epistle after studying them this week. We are going to be blessed in the weeks ahead. What we're going to look at this morning is how we can greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible when we are in the fire, when we're actually going through trials, when we're in the furnace and dealing with squeezings and afflictions and all the things that come in testing. And so maybe Peter is even now dealing with maybe the, the believer who says, you know, I'm, I'm scattered abroad throughout the region of Turkey. We've been persecuted. We've had to flee Uh, the, the, The persecution is mounting, it's growing. I've lost my home and my family and my possessions. I'm struggling. And so what is the purpose of all of this? And right now, I'm not feeling a joy inexpressible that we saw last week uh, in verse 8. I'm I'm not feeling that. How do I get a joy inexpressible when I'm going through seasons like that? Well, Peter's going to answer that for us this morning. He's going to answer it very simply with the gospel. In verse 10, as to this salvation, here is the focus of the believer. Here is where we're to plant our stakes. This is to be our meditation, our joy, our delight. Here is where abundant joy is found, and here is where it's unchanging. Because it's a gospel that does not change, our joy doesn't have to go up and down with our circumstances. This gospel is what preserves our joy then when we are in the furnace. If your trial is sinking you and you have no joy right now as you sit here in this body, you feel you're about to become a cinder in the fire that you're in, you're on the brink of anger and you're sensing the cry of your heart, this is unfair, maybe even the sense of walking away from it all, this morning I want to give you the remedy. I want to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have got to go back to the gospel, to look your eyes out at Jesus Christ, the pearl of great price. You need to continually rehearse it to your mind and your soul. You need to roll it around from every angle. The the scriptures show us all different angles of this glorious gospel. I want you to, to really get this this morning. Because too many look at the gospel and say, yeah, I I know that. I know that. I believe Jesus died for me, and now I have eternal life. Let's get into the deeper stuff. Let's get into the things of life. That's kind of milk. I need the meat of the word. I heard this example this week. It's kind of like teaching kids uh, Sunday school. You teach them about Jesus and parables and miracles. I feel sorry for the teachers again and again and again. And the kids say, I already know that. I, I understand that. Of course, Jesus died for my sins. Everybody gets that. Get on with it. Right, Sunday school teachers? You hear that again. And that is too often, I think, the mindset of the church is what they say is, I, I know that already. Let's get on to the order of decrees with infralapsarian and superlapsarian. Let's get in to all of those things. So please hear me this morning. The people who are like that as a pastor, I've never watched them suffer well. The people who don't understand what we look at this morning, that think that the gospel is something for uh, for to get to believe and get saved, and now I go on to bigger and higher things, I've never seen those kind of people do well in the furnace. The gospel is not just a little body of information, and we say, "I I learned that information, now what's next? I've mastered a whole book. I know all the data in a class. Let's move on to the next class. What hit me this week is I'm guessing the angels are probably smarter than we are. Can't prove it, but I think think that's true. Do you think the angels know the doctrines of the gospel? Do you think they struggle with the theology of God? They're in the presence of God daily. I think they understand God better than we ever will. How do you think their theology is then on on understanding Christ and the Spirit and all of these realms that they see and live in daily? So my question, we're going to see in verse 12, that these angels are longing to look into our salvation. It's in a present tense there. 
um, for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, the angels have been longing and desiring to gaze into the salvation that we're going to be studying this morning in Peter. They're, they're literally taken up with the gospel. They see that the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's bottomless. Thousands and thousands of years, they're still gazing, wanting to understand it, see it, and marvel at it. It's bottomless. It goes on. Its realities and beauties can be searched and enjoyed for all of eternity. We will never grow weary in digging in and understanding these realities. You will not come to the end of the gospel, or to, it is, it's bottomless. You will not ever get to the bottom of the beauties and the depth of what we have in this gospel. So if you sit here this morning with the gospel fully understood, you know nothing of it at all. So it is not something we grow out of, but the gospel, again, is something we grow into. It is to be what our hearts are literally taken up with, we gather together as the people of God to celebrate and worship and, and preach about it and build one another up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning we will see that it is the, the Bible from cover to cover is the gospel. It, it is simple. Yes, a child can understand it. Yet it is profound to take up our minds and hearts for the rest of eternity. It's simple for a child, and yet we can study it forever and still see more and more beauty to this gospel. I've spent the last 30 years taken up with it. I've studied it, and I've sought to know it from every angle possible. I've sat in my office with my, my Bible for hours, studying, weeping, searching to understand it uh, theologically, experientially. I, I have given myself to this gospel. I've labored in it. I've meditated on it. I've prayed over it. And now I've been taking First Peter chapter 1. And when we studied the Lord's Prayer, it was a real uh, foundation to, to study and, and to come before God and pray the Lord's Prayer daily. And so we looked at the beauty of that and I've been just doing that with First Peter 1. I would encourage you to do the same, to just come and, and pray those realities that we've been looking at again and again. And they're just breaking in my heart afresh. It's springing up a joy that affliction cannot squelch. I've studied hundreds of men and women in history. I have a real passion for biographies to look at men and women of God, how they got saved and how they served God and how they finished and went to glory. I've been taken up by this gospel. I've watched their faith endure the hardest of trials because of the gospel in their heart, and it brought them through the waters safely. I've shepherded you, and I've watched so many of you go through things that are so difficult, and this gospel has been sufficient, and it's brought each one of you through it. I've shepherded the flock for 25 years, and I've seen weak, feeble saints endure the greatest of hardships with joy because of this gospel and a faith the size of a mustard seed that they kept looking at the gospel and it was sufficient. It was sufficient to bring you through every high and stormy gale. The gospel as to our salvation in verse 10. The angels cannot get over it. And so this morning I would like to just ask you, have, have you? Have you gotten over what the angels for thousands of years long to look into? Are you like the kid who says, I already know this? Are you like the angels who are lost in its glory and you just keep looking into it deeper and deeper and sweeter and sweeter? It's the subject of my study, my heart, my worship, and my aim. And so have you just taken up the gospel or has it taken over you? This will dictate how you go through the furnace. And so I'd like to go before our God and I would like to pray that all of our hearts would be taken up with this gospel, that we will be able to endure the things that we will face on our way to our eternal home. So let's all join our hearts together and go before God and ask for this grace. Father God, we come before you and we sing holy, holy, holy. God, the whole earth is full of your glory. And so we marvel. We cover our eyes and our feet. We, we see your majestic holiness. God, no one could see it and live 
And now through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can come right into its presence, loved, accepted, and safe. You tell us we can stand now in your presence with great joy. And so God, let every heart be taken up with a gospel like this this morning. Please don't let it be cold. Don't let it become sterile. Don't let it become a secondary thing in our lives. I'm praying this morning by your Holy Spirit that you would make it central in every mind and every heart. God, if there are any unbelievers who have never looked into this gospel, that this morning you would give them eyes to see. God, that they would see the glory of Christ and call upon his name and be saved. I pray for the believers, Lord, that their hearts would be strangely warmed again as we look at such a beautiful truth and a beautiful reality. God, I pray that you would meet us here in a special way and you will now do through your word what no man can do. We pray that your spirit would meet every need individually that sits here in this building this morning. God, we pray that you would get all the glory. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Look with me in verse 10. <clears throat> As to this salvation, <clears throat> the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you and these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. I want to try to just start with trying to give you the logic <coughs> of Peter's thought. <clears throat> the prophets in the Old Testament, they would write these things that God told them to write down. And then it says they would make careful search and inquiry into the things that they wrote about this gospel, trying to understand who's the person, what time, when is this going to take place. They would study and search their own writings to see when is this going to happen. This is glorious. Let me understand it better and let me long for the day of the consolation of Israel. Then the apostles come on the scene and preachers. And they come and they make known this gospel to you that there's been fulfillment. Jesus Christ came into this world and he fulfilled it. He has brought this salvation that they prophesied of. And so we now rejoice and we bring and proclaim and preach this gospel to you. This gospel that angels in heaven are just longing to look at and see and understand more of its glory. And so the point of his thought is then you should be taken up with it the same way. The privilege of the time that we live in this morning is called the fullness of the time, a time of reformation, the time of fulfillment, the time to take this gospel, not to Jerusalem, to the nations that they could call upon the name and be saved. It's the ingathering now of the nations, the Gentiles. And so this is no small thing. That the person and time has been manifested to us. That the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow have been revealed. And Jesus Christ walked to Gethsemane and there died in our place. So the sufferings have been made known. Do you realize the season then that we live in as the people of God? So we live in it, guys. This can't grow stale or familiar to your heart. You have got to fight for this gospel to keep it alive and your treasure and your hope and not to let these other things that will disappoint and never be satisfying eclipse this gospel. Keep yourselves in the love of Christ, Paul wrote to Jude. So this is what I have prayed and preached and counseled and fought for for almost two decades at this church. We have fought for the glory of the gospel, the hope that will purify us as gold when we're put in the furnace. This gospel, as we said, will we go in and become a cinder or will we come out purified gold? This gospel will determine which one we're going to be. And so if we understand this gospel and we love it and we treasure it, when we go into this furnace, pure gold is going to come out from the afflictions. This gospel will dictate what your time will be like 
in the furnace? Will it be devastating or will it be purifying? Will it destroy you or will it refine gold? This is going to be the key to your life. So if you will, let's dig in this morning to Peter's introduction. Look at verse 10. As to this salvation, well, the first question we should ask ourselves, what what salvation? What is this? Well, this is what we've been looking at for months in 1 Peter, the Trinitarian salvation that we saw in verse 2. In verse 3, the, the choosing, the electing, the foreknowledge of God that began in eternity past. The Spirit in time regenerated you. He, he gave you life. He opened your eyes to believe and to repent. He, re, he gave you from death to life. And then the work of Christ through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says, unto obedience, that now I love Christ and I want to obey him and be found following after him. And it's caused you to be born again to this hope of eternal life, this hope that is certain. It won't fade away. It can't be destroyed. And it's protected by the very power of God through purging and purifying our faith. So the salvation then, that salvation that now Peter will bring into kind of even a clearer focus, kind of like a a camera where you're focusing the lens as he's been talking about these eternal things. And now he's going to move it in to Jesus Christ, my favorite view of anywhere. And if I could pick any place to travel in the world to see the most beautiful sights, I would joyfully choose the picture that we are going to look at this morning. The Bible contains my favorite photo of all time. I don't need a picture to hang up on my wall. I have a photo of Christ in this word, and I have seen Christ, and I have then seen the Father. So this, what is this salvation? And I'd like to address this morning what this salvation is. And so I would like to address believers, and I'd also like to address if there's any unbelievers who are sitting in our midst, is I just want to address you this morning as well, is this word salvation. As to this salvation, and I've had many unbelievers tell me, I don't even like that word. I'm tired of so-called Christians saying, I got saved. You know, I, I have salvation. They, they don't even like that term. I'm burned out on it. I, I, and, and now I need to be saved? If that is not enough, now I see that, that this whole word isn't just made up by Christians. It's in the Bible. It's in the very Bible. This whole Bible is about salvation. And so into this salvation, we will look this morning. And so I just want you to see then that you need to be saved. Whether you feel like it or not is not the question. God, your creator, has declared that you need to be saved and you need to be rescued from the wrath that is to come. You need a salvation. And so this whole Bible is about God who designed and worked out a plan of salvation. So if we need a salvation, then we need to figure out what we need to be saved from. So instead of going through the whole Bible and showing you the answer, I've decided I just want to stay in Peter this morning and let him answer, what, what is it that I need to be saved from? What is this salvation? So we'll flip around to a few verses. Turn to 1 Peter 2.24. <clears throat> Verse 24, and he himself, which is Jesus, the son of God, he himself bore what? He bore our sins. So all all of our sins, he bore our sins where? In his body on the cross. So the son of God hung on a cross. Your sins are imputed to him. God pulls out the sword of justice and he punishes his own son on that cross for your sin. It says that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by Jesus' wounds you were healed. And so the Creator has the right to tell His creation how to live and to tell them what is right. And that is, not, that is actually not our prerogative to decide. I've had many unbelievers tell me that they, they know what is right and what, how they should live and what they should do. But actually it's the Creator who has that right. Just even you thinking you have that right shows your sin and why you need to be saved. God revealed righteousness. 
He revealed what is righteousness. And you know what? He didn't come up with a standard. He is the standard. He revealed himself who is perfect righteousness and how he wants his creator, uh, his created ones to live is in light of his righteousness. And he said, the soul that sins must die. It has to, to die. James says, if you break the law at one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. So for one sin, you're guilty of breaking the whole law of God. Our issue this morning is sin. We need to be saved from our sins because the wrath of God is on us because he's holy and just. He cannot wink at sin. If you hope to stand before God and he will just let you in because he grades on a curve, you have no hope at all. For one sin, you're guilty and you must stand before this God for your sin And so to be saved, I've got to be saved from my sins because I need to be saved from God who's angry against my sin. His wrathful, just uh, punishment is against my sin. We need to be saved from God who will punish them. His justice must be satisfied. So I want you to hear this morning that sin is a bigger problem than you ever imagined. It's not a little thing. And as you sit here, I pray the Spirit of God will come on your heart to show you sin is a great thing. So great that God would even put his own son up on a cross and punish him for it. Because there was no other way to get rid of the punishment. That's how serious it is. The Son of God hanging on a cross, dying. Because you had to be saved from your sins. It's a very, very serious thing. And it's what's killing your life this morning. It's what's killing your heart. It's why everything falls apart. I keep trying to fix it. I hope in this and it falls apart. I try to clean myself up and I can't seem to change the heart, the fountain. It just keeps sinning. I can't fix this problem. It's why your life is falling apart. It's what is keeping you from a holy God. You've been made for this God and you can't draw near to him because sin has blocked his presence. You can't even pray and ask him for something. Give me food today. You're separated. That Your sin has blocked you from this God. I've got to be saved from my sins. That's this whole book. God sent his son for salvation. You need to be saved from your sins. And Peter declares that Jesus Christ bore our sins in his body on a cross. He hung on a cross and he bore the wrath of God for sin. By his wounds, you're healed. You're healed. <coughs> for Christ, look, uh, turn to 1 Peter 3.18. And while you do, the, I'm just going to give you an illustration. Is I want you to picture that someone, I've got five kids and he breaks into my home and he kills all of my children uh, and my wife. Uh, let's say maybe he spares one child. And we go into the courtroom and the judge says, you, you are guilty. You, you, you are guilty for breaking and ki- into his house and killing all of his family. And now, but I'm going to let you go free. Do you, do you think I would appreciate that? And some of you just think, you know, I'm guilty of breaking the law. I've, the son of God had to die. And now God, just let me be free. Let just ignore my sin. That's, a, that's way more violating than what's going on in this courtroom of just walking away and letting this guy go free who killed my whole family. If it was your family, you would cry for justice. You would demand it and you would fight for it the rest of your life that justice came to the man who killed your family. And so we love justice when it, it's something that offends us, but God demands justice because we have offended him with our sin. We have to be saved from our sins and you love justice when it's for you. God has justice, and he has to have it satisfied against your sin. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. He is the only just one. We are the unjust ones. He died for our sins once for all, one-time payment, in order that he might, what? Bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so this is also what you need to be saved from. You, because of your sin, were alienated from God. You've been separated from God. You were made in his image, and and therefore you were made to be at home with God. 
and you will never find peace, joy, or happiness until you're brought back into a relationship with God. And there's no way of getting back because of your sin. You're alienated from God. And you were made to be at home with this God. And that is the root of every problem, every pain, every feeling of emptiness. I've said it before. It's like always being December, but never Christmas. Unbeliever, you know what I'm talking about. It just, you know, something's not right. I've been made for something more. I've been made for something bigger. Well, that something bigger is you were made for God and you're separated from him. And it says here, Jesus died that, that he might bring us to God. He might bring you back to God. You need God. Your heart will always be restless until you find your rest in God. And this morning, there's a salvation that I'm proclaiming to you that can bring you back into a relationship with God. Salvation is come home. Come home to the God who you've been made for to be in a relationship with. That's what your heart is longing for and crying for this morning. If you look at 1 Peter 4.17, the third thing we need to be saved from. <clears throat> Peter says it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will become the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so what he's telling us then is judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. So judgment is hanging over my head. And as much as I try to entertain myself, do drugs, find relationships and say, woo, I can't hear you. I know I can sense that there's a judgment hanging over me. And if someone tells me I'm guilty, like this crazy pastor this morning, I get mad. I, I don't like to know that because I'm trying to ignore that. I'm trying to suppress it and not deal with it this morning. And what is going on is there's a judgment because you know that you're in sin. You know you're separated. There's something God put it in our hearts and you're suppressing it because you know there's a judgment day coming and you can't get away from it. And I try to get it out of my mind with loud music all the time, but I can't. I know that my life can't stand up to the final judgment that's coming at the end of this age, and I just want to ignore that. When we will appear before the judgment seat of God, where he says all of mankind will come to that day, and you'll come before a God who has perfect knowledge. He has retentive knowledge. He will forget nothing of what you've done. You can't hide in a closet or in the darkness. Everything will be open and laid bare before this God who knows all. You will give an account, and that sits on you, and that's why you fear death. That's why you fear death is because is of judgment. You know, you know it, it's coming. And you need to be saved from that awful day. And so Jesus has come to save you from that awful day so that in Christ, when you stand before him, you're going to be judged by his account and his record, what he did. And God's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you're going to be able to walk through that judgment and not be cast into the pit of hell forever. And so you need to be saved from the, the reality in your mind that that day is coming and it's coming maybe today. It's coming soon. And so you need a salvation. You need to not push this off and keep ignoring it. You need a salvation. The fourth thing you need to be saved from is be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. He's, there's, a, there's a real devil. I thought that was just make-believe, a little guy on your shoulder. No, he's real. He's one of the most beautiful angels that God ever made. In his pride, he was cast out. And now he is a roaring lion and he's angry. And he wants everyone in this building to go to hell and spend all of eternity with him. That's his desire. And he's tireless and he's undeterred in his hatred to God and anyone that he created. He wants to destroy everyone into this pit with him. And so Jesus came into this world and, and the devil had power over death because of the sin that he brought in through Adam. And now he has this power to you die and you're cast into eternal judgment. And Jesus went into death. He went right into death, and it says he conquered the devil. In Hebrews 2, it says he rendered him powerless. He ripped the teeth right out of the devil. There's no sting anymore to him for the believer. You actually go into death now, and I want you to hear this. The devil has been rendered powerless. When you stand before this God, powerless to do anything to you now with death and further judgment and separation 
from God. He came to save us from that. So that now death is the chariot ride to heaven for the believer. It's your best day. Your death day will be your best day. He came to save us from the devil and death and the power that he held over us. So Jesus went into death and he conquered him. I need to be saved from the power that the devil has over my death. And then next he came and he saved us from hopelessness, which we've been studying. And I won't park on this for long, but you're born again to a living hope. And what I said is every hope that you have is dying or dead. Every hope you've ever had died or it's going to die. At death, you'll lose every hope that you've ever had. And so that he's come and he's, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope that will give us eternal life with him forever and ever and ever. And so I need to be saved from this hopeless life in existence. And I need to be saved, as Peter talks about, from futility. If I'm just some living organism that, that dies and then life is over, there, there, there's no hope for anything. Why would you try to be moral or do anything good? That is the most hopeless, purposeless thing I've ever heard of. I'm just a living organism that'll be here for a little while and die and I just don't exist anymore. You're going to be hopeless, dark, broken. It's going to destroy you. And this gospel can come and it can save you from that uh, temporalness and uh, futility of mind and thought. And so I need to be saved from that. I need a salvation then. So I want you to listen this morning. And verse 10, as to this salvation, is you need to be saved. Everyone in this room, whoever has not been saved, then you need to be saved. That is why the Son of God came into this world. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came on a rescue mission. Peter will call it in verse 10, the grace that would come to you, the grace that would come to you. And so I just want you to hear this basic gospel. Peter says it's the grace that has come to you. And so the question as to whether you have been saved or not is, has the grace of God come to you? It's a it's a salvation. The grace comes to rescue and deliver you. Excuse me, God has come to you. So the initiative of salvation, hear this very clearly, is God. God is the one who comes to rescue his people. And so hear this clearly, the gospel never starts uh, with what you do. It will never begin with, I need to do this. But rather, God has broken through. He has broke into history. He created history. And in his own son, he entered into history. Christian salvation is different than any other religion. All other religions, it, it's a teaching. Buddha, I, I don't, whether he lived, died, was raised, there's nothing about him. All it is is about his teaching. It's a teaching that you take up and you live to get to this place. Muhammad is the same thing. It's a teaching. And it all starts with you and you follow these teachings and you try to do these things to get right With God, every cult starts with you. And Christianity says this is what God has done in history. This is what God has broken in and what he has done. The gospel does not start with you. I want you to hear that this morning. It doesn't start with you taking the Ten Commandments and trying to go live a better life. It doesn't, and maybe you're even more sanctified and say, I want to do the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to start there and go live that. It starts with God, and he broke into our world, and he came into this world fully God and fully man in the person of Jesus Christ, and he came and he lived out a perfect righteousness like no one who ever walked this earth. It was a God kind of righteousness, and then he went up on a cross, and as we've already read, he died for our sins, the the just one for the unjust, and he breathed his last, and he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. And now he's endowed with salvation for any who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be what? They'll be saved. There's a salvation that he offers now for all who will call upon his name. And so the gospel is the salvation that we need. And it does not start with do this. It does not start there, but it says believe this. This is what God has done Believe this. 
Don't go do this. Believe this is where the gospel starts. If God has not entered into this world and secured our salvation, your faith is void, vain, useless. All of your works will avail to nothing. Jesus has come, and he did everything necessary for salvation, to purchase your salvation. And now the message of God, the gospel of grace, the salvation that we need is offered to you in a person. It's offered to you now in a person. Receive him. Believe in him. Repent. Call upon him and you will be saved. Jesus, it means him who saves. He is a savior. He came on a mission to save that which was lost. So get this. The controlling factor in your relationship with God, uh, with the world, and with yourself, it will not be what you have done. It will be what God has done. That is the grace of God. <clears throat> you will sing about it. You will love it. You will treasure the grace of God all of your days. This is so beautiful. When you get this, it will be everything to you. God has done something world-shattering he sent his son into this world and he died in our place. Don't miss this phrase. He says it in verse 10, it's the grace that would come to you. And so this is that coming of Jesus that would come, but also personally to you. This grace that will come to you. So I'll ask you this morning, has a foreign power invaded you? Has a foreign power, has the God from outside come within? This is the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is I look at these things, it starts with me, and I start living by a code of conduct. Christianity is God enters in. He comes into your life and he invades it. Has God entered your life and this grace of God then has completely made you new? A new creation that now you have forgiveness of sin and a love to God and a love to others. And he's changing your life from the inside to the outside. He has invaded it. I'm not asking about a bunch of rules. Has God invaded your heart? Has the grace of God come to you? I was so happy in my little unsaved life, just enjoying this world and finding pleasure in it. And he entered and he started messing with me in so many ways. And he began to all of a sudden awaken me to this reality that I'm under judgment. And he started, I started seeing sin and I started getting sick and thinking I was going to die. How am I going to stand before this God? And it sent me, I got to find a remedy. I've got to find an answer. And this grace just started drawing me and bringing me in. I couldn't sleep at night. I had to read my Bible every night to fall asleep. And he just began working. And then a man named Billy Graham, whether you like him or not, I love him. He came to Denver. And he came and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and it messed with my whole life, surrendered everything to Christ in the most wonderful way and the grace of God invaded and messed with me and changed me ever since. I remember driving home a few days later from a full day. I had a buddy from high school and uh, he was following the Grateful Dead, just a drug addict. He got saved. No one even preached to him. He, he read a Gideon's Bible in a hotel room. Isn't that beautiful? Leave those things around. You never know what God will do. And so he gets saved, and we just spent the whole day praying, fellowshipping, and worshiping. It was so amazing where we used to get together and drink, and now we just got together and did that. And I remember driving home. It was summer, and I had my window open, and there was a guy. Some of you young kids never heard of him. His name was Don Francisco. And this guy, I, had, I was just cranking up this song. If, I didn't care if the whole neighborhood heard and saw me singing, Jesus is Lord of the way I feel, and just worshiping and praising God. I'm telling you, I got invaded. <laughs> I got invaded. And I did not take up a new set of beliefs. I used to believe this, but now I believe this. I need a little bit of religion, but God invaded me. And this Friday night, we heard a testimony from one of the gals in our college group and it was so sweet and pure. And as she shared it, it was just all I could say is God invaded that heart. She, she's just all together born again. She titled her, she said, every message needs a title. I, I forgot it now, but it was something like uh, the grace of God, the glory of God that saves sinners or something like that. If, she, if she's here and doesn't mind yelling out the name, I don't want to embarrass her. Never. That's it. What a title. 
And all I can say is she got invaded by the grace of God and her testimony is it's changing everything about me. I was a little feminist and now I'm coming on Tuesday nights to learn about being a godly woman and it's messing with everything about me. And it's just, it's beautiful what the grace of God is doing in her heart. And so I've told you this many times, but I hate the statement, I've always been a Christian. Just don't use that with me. Use it with someone else. <laughs> it, it just violates everything that we've just looked at this morning. So a testimony is how the grace of God has invite, invaded your life. And I'm just going to bring up our last set of baptisms. There was a guy who stood here in high school, and he said, I hated God. And you could see there was just this passion against God. He's raised in the church, and all of a sudden, grace invaded this young man, and he stands now in love with God and proclaiming his desire to follow him the rest of his life. That's invasion. That doesn't make sense. That's not natural. And then there was a girl who was raised in truth and believed it. And she said she had this massive idol called volleyball. And the grace of God came to her and started messing with her and causing her greatest strengths to be removed. This amazing player is now benched for no reason. And it left her with all of her thoughts and her hurts. And the grace of God invaded her and transformed her, saying, Now I just love him more than volleyball. There's an invasion. My idol, I have a new love. And I've gladly put that aside. And then this young girl was raised in a beautiful Christian home as well. She had good teaching, and just out of the blue, she's sharing God invaded her heart and revealed his beauty to her, and now she is following him. And so this is so much bigger than uh, it's as easy as ABC, accept, believe, and confess. This is so much bigger. I see three main views today. I'm sorry for getting so distracted on this one word, but it's, it's worth parking on. There's three views I see kind of today on salvation, the intellectual view. And that's this view I hold to a certain set of doctrinal beliefs. I, I believe in the Westminster Confession. I have all these doctrinal beliefs. I believe in a literal six-day creation. I believe in the virgin birth, etc., etc. And it's no more than a creed that you have taken up. But the grace of God has not taken you up. And so you've probably been sitting here saying, yeah, preach, preach. Those are great truths. And really God's saying, I want to invade your heart this morning. All it is is intellectual. And in this morning, I want to invade your heart with the grace of God that it would break through just all of your intellectual knowledge that you've taken up. Will you take up Christ this morning? If you've been in the church 40 years, I'm asking you this morning to repent and be saved. And come and let this grace of God take over your heart. Second is the behavioral view, which says doctrine isn't important. It just divides. God doesn't care about what you know. He just cares about what you do. And I, I just live like Jesus. I don't need to believe all this stuff. I love other people like my own self. I care for the body, the homeless, the abused, human trafficking. I'm all about it. I don't get lost in the atonement and that resurrection stuff. I just keep the golden rule. And I know that God is pleased with all the stuff I do. And if I don't get into heaven, nobody will. No, you won't get into heaven with that. And all of that is you trying to start with you and get yourself into the favor of God. And it's the grace of God invading this world and you need to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your good deeds this morning are like a filthy rag before God. They'll never get you approval or favor. Look away from, if that is you this morning, look at Christ who invaded this world and is now endowed with salvation, looking for an empty hand that will cry out and call to him to be saved. The third is, I'm going to call it the mystical view. And to really understand this view, I think you should take a field trip to Boulder, Colorado. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time there with my son and I learned a lot and I've heard it's I'm just really spiritual I, I've had encounters with God I felt something there was an amazing presence that pressed on me one of uh, Jordan's friends shared with me he was meditating and he saw this presence that was so beautiful and he said and it, it just said bow down and it, it made him bow down, and he was telling me all these things. And it turned out, I guarantee it was the devil, you know, a demon himself, because this kid has been lost in every transcendental. I mean, he's, he's as lost as I've ever seen. But he says, I'm the most spiritual person I've ever known. 
and he does drugs and meditates and enjoys. And so it's that mystical view. Uh, I can't really define it, but it's just a profound experience. And it's always summed up with, I'm just a spiritual guy. That'll never save you. And so my prayer for everyone in this room this morning, let's forget everything but this. That, that, that none of that is Christianity. But it's the grace that would come to you. There's a gospel that Peter begins with as to this salvation. There's a salvation that has come in Christ Jesus. Has the grace of God come to you? Has that happened to you? Has he come to you? And I'll tell you this, he comes in a million different ways. For Paul, it was a bright light. For others, it's a slow. They can't even tell you the season, the exact time. They just know like a decade of how God was drawing them. And so I've already told you, I don't think you can stereotype conversion. And, and you know, the, it, it happens instantly. But our experience of understanding it, sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it's a slow fade. All of these different things. But has it happened to you? No matter how it came, has the grace of God come to you? That needs to be answered because that is what this is all about. He came to save. And so please see that the grace of God is that salvation does not start with what you do. Look away from that this morning. But it's what God has done. And he broken, has he broken then through into your life? And has he invaded it with this gospel? The grace of God. I love that word. We talked about his mercy in verse 3. And God looks at us in our misery and mercy is stirred to help us. He gives us pity. He looks at those who couldn't help themselves and it drew out the mercy of God. And grace, though, is nothing like that. Grace is not that God owes you. It's not the natural response to something. It actually acts contrary to what is seen or the moment. It's unmerited. It's not merited. It's unmerited. You could have never merited it. Grace is not giving to someone what is owed. It's not, I'm going to work hard for you, God. I'll go be a missionary if you'll save me. I'll help needy people. I'll even go to Southside Bible Church if you will save me. It's more like someone begging on a street corner. Uh, and, and you stop and you give them some money in your lunch because you feel so bad for them. That's really nice. That's mercy, but it's not grace. Grace would be more like this. There's someone who hates you and they're slandering you and they're bent on destroying you with every bit of their being. And all of a sudden there's a turn and they're in great need. And now you come and you meet that need. That, that shouldn't have been drawn out of you. That's the opposite of what should have been drawn out of you. So if you can get this, grace is counterintuitive. It's absolutely shocking. That God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Grace is we were sinners and haters of God and his response was to send his son in the world to die to save us from sin. This whole gospel of grace, salvation that has come, it's shocking. And it was toward those who were sworn enemies. And it was while we were yet sinners, we did not merit it, we de demerited it, we truly deserved and earned a life of torment under the righteous wrath of God. And grace appeared. Incarnate, the Son of God clothed in humanity. And it lived a life that God required for us to be in his presence. And it died a gruesome death that only we deserve. So grace is that now God will treat you as if you did everything that the Son did. He will treat you like you lived the perfect life of Christ and not your smelly, stinky, rebellious life. He'll actually put you in Christ and now look at you as if you lived a perfect life. And grace will now treat, treat you now as if he punished you for all of your sin and trespasses against him as a son of God hung on a cross in your place. So I just want to say that grace to me is shocking. It's giving to those who totally don't deserve it. They deserve the opposite. It's given to us simply because God is gracious. Has this grace come to you? And I'll tell you this as we close, as we jump back into our context. Be taken up by grace. It's the only way through the fire. To endure all that will come to you on your journey to your true home. 
There's just so many things that will come handpicked by God. And what he's going to use is this gospel. This gospel is that the, the furnace will purify our faith and our, our belief in this and our love. Though you don't see him, you will love him. This gospel is the key to us getting home, that it's invaded us and it's taken up our hearts and it's not stale and something we just use. You know, that old saying, Jesus didn't come for a, a makeover, but a takeover. You know, I just don't use him and apply him to my life where I want him. He is my life. That's what grace does when it comes to a heart. And so this is what our faith is to be in. This reality is what our faith is to look at, to deepen and grow in. The furnace makes it brighter and sweeter. How I love Jesus. And so in closing, I just any unbeliever who is sitting here in this church, before you leave, I want you, you don't, you don't need a minister to be saved. All you need to, to, to be joined in a marriage to Christ is in the secret of your heart as we close in prayer is for you to cry out to God, He's a Savior, and I need to be saved. I'm tired of moralism. I'm tired of having no heart for God. All I need in the quietness of my heart is a God who finds glory and delight in saving sinners. And so I want you to deal with that God. And I'm willing to skip lunch and stay here all day. Nothing would give me more pleasure than if you wanted to come forward and not leave this place till you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Come see me afterwards and some of the other elders. We will stay and fight for your souls. And because there is a salvation that has come into this world. And it began with God and he just wants you to now call upon him and look to what he has done and believe and be saved. And that is how God gets glory, is in saving sinners who don't deserve it. And so I love that none of you have to be worthy. All you have to do is look to the worthy one this morning and find this glorious salvation. So let's close in prayer. Father, I come before you and I thank you as to this salvation. God, this salvation that the, the prophets longed to look more into and the angels uh, just love it. They can't get enough of it. They want to see more of it. Lord, I pray that our hearts aren't cold then. How could them who, who didn't receive it, us who have received it, not just be giddy about this, not be focused on it, centered on it, in love with it, talking about it everywhere and anywhere we go. God, how, how can we be stale to something this great? We live in the fullness of the times. We get to behold the, the work of Christ as we await his second coming. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this great salvation. And I pray for any unbelievers now, Lord, that you would prick their hearts. You would not let them continue in not being saved with the threat of judgment, the, the separation from you because of sin, a devil devouring them, wanting to send them to the pit of hell. God, their salvation. Today is the day of salvation. I pray that they would call upon you. They wouldn't feel safe until they are safe in your arms. Don't let them go find safety in something stupid that's going to pass away and perish and be sober in the morning. God, let this morning be the day of their salvation. I pray that your spirit would move on each and every unbelieving heart in this room. And God, let every believer praise you. And if they're in the furnace right now, lift their eyes again to such a great salvation and let it gird them up and strengthen and empower them to keep journeying in this temporal trial that will end in eternal fulfillment. God, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen.